I think things at Ferrari are starting to get ugly. And what I'm talking about is the inevitable breakup of Carlos Sainz and the Scuderia. And it all stems from a certain magazine cover of a certain Monaco publication that really got under my skin. ESPN shared with the internet the front cover from the latest issue of the Monegasque, which is the authority of Monaco's modern society. And really, it should read the audacity of Monaco's modern society. What is wrong with this picture? Yes. I hear you loud and clear. It's the racing overalls, isn't it? Oh no, they use the 2023 racing overalls. Actually, it's the 2024 car. And um, excuse me, they're using the 2025 driver lineup? Somebody didn't do their research. When you look at this, you go, there's Lewis there playing with his horsey and Charles playing with his toy car. Where's Pucci? I hear you ask. Or where's Carlos? Well, he's nowhere to be seen, because as far as this magazine is concerned, Carlos Sainz does not exist. And it does also cover some other meanings that might not be all that glowing about Lewis Hamilton either, because you've got Charles here playing with the car, probably meaning that he's looking to try and improve the performance of the car, whereas Lewis is playing with the Ferrari logo and brand itself, maybe sort of alluding to the idea that he's kind of being brought in as a brand partner, instilling the idea that Ferrari's becoming a super team, that it's there to increase Ferrari's notoriety. So if they wanted to make them look like teammates, they would have had Charles and Lewis playing with cars together, not separately. So really, Charles is the only one that comes out glowing, and of course he would, it's the monogasque. Shout out to Nuria for the tip-off, by the way. Her art is better, and Red Bull Racing approved. Look, I know, I know, I'm obsessing over Carlos Sainz. Believe me, I really didn't want to make another video about the topic, because I was bored of it. But look, I saw that cover, and I just couldn't help myself. And I bet that they also came up with this magazine, because Carlos Sainz does not live in Monaco, whereas Lewis and Charles do. And... I have no doubts about this take. Even though Ferrari didn't commission this front cover, because clearly why would they have greenlit this mishmash of a thing, the sentiment though does seem to line up with the notion that the team is looking to eschew itself of the abysmal post-2020 era, where Carlos Sainz was signed to steady the ship after the relationship between the Scuderia and Bethel broke down. So inevitably they needed somebody to aid Charles Leclerc, the new de facto leader. The former future star was the star now. But then Carlos didn't necessarily follow the script that Ferrari gave him and outscored him in his first season. And yes, I know, you are sick and tired of that hearing that, but numerically and objectively, it happened. There are various circumstances that contributed toward it, but that was probably not what Ferrari was expecting. They were expecting Charles to do better. And, uh in terms of the championship he didn't. Which is why that magazine cover really speaks volumes and pretty much sums up the situation at Ferrari. Carlos Sainz's time with the Scuderia is coming to an end and the relationship as I've seen it has not always been that smooth, contrary to the smooth operator himself. It's never really seemed inherently sound and now that I've seen it in really sharp relief this year, knowing that he's going, he's never really been the proper Ferrari driver or the Ferrari wingman or number two. He's never really driven for Ferrari. There was always something happening that caused a sense of unease or friction with the Spaniard, that it was just never that serene for that long. It could easily be down to one of the reasons why the race cited that there were 10 reasons Ferrari signed him in the first place that being his intelligence. Carlos is quite the strategist when an opportunity opens up. In fact, you could easily see that opportunity is what gifted him all three of his victories, that it came through one circumstance or another. Two of those coming from him bucking the trend and ignoring orders that the team and the pit wall gave him. He took initiative and that ultimately gave him his first win and then that glorious Singapore victory that will go down in modern history as being one of the most audacious yet brilliant. And of course, I'm not saying Ferrari would be sad that they would have won a race, especially in 2023, but the mindset of Carlos Sainz never really seemed to blend harmoniously into the Ferrari culture. It's sort of what's making me really concerned about how Lewis Hamilton will sort himself out at Ferrari because this is the party rule that even Michael Schumacher followed, that you don't just drive at Ferrari, you drive for Ferrari, not for yourself. Everyone races for each other. If a driver falters, he apologizes and the entire team circles around them. That sort of unity is rarely seen outside that team. And I really don't see that being something that Carlos really subscribed to over the years. 
Nah, don't worry, I'm not going to do the old YouTuber trick where I tell you two of those wins came from objecting team instructions and going it alone, and the third was mainly down to Max Verstappen's charge being cut short at the same track, where two years previously, Leclerc was gifted said opportunity when the same befell the Dutchman. Objecting team orders, even if it's meaning that they get something out of it, it's almost sacrilege at Ferrari. Rubens Barrichello is probably the best example out of all of this, and Felipe Massa, he experienced both sides of the same coin, being the leader and the wingman throughout his entire Ferrari career. And then there's Kimi Raikkonen, who probably didn't care what Ferrari thought. Barrichello put up with a lot during his time at Ferrari, and whilst he got plenty of victories with them, it came at the cost of having to play second fiddle to Michael Schumacher as did every single teammate before him. Ferrari does tend to circle around one particular driver, regardless about what they say in the press or on social media these days, and it all comes back to one particular interview that sums up what Barrichello had to deal with almost regularly, where he and Michael would be in a meeting with engineers and personnel, and then the meeting would come to a close. Or at least that's what Barrichello thought. And when he gets up to leave, they start talking again. This is according to Rubens, and Michael's still there. They don't really pay much mind to Rubens leaving the room, so he thinks that's weird. He pulls his chair back up again, he sits down, and he just observes. Nobody asks him any questions, he's just, as he says, there. And also, even though Michael and he got on and they were friendly with one another, Schumacher would never really give him any advice or support him. The Brazilian was effectively left to either look from afar or figure things out on his own. And for the most part, Rubens got the bigger picture. He had an opportunity to drive for Ferrari. And that's what gets most drivers through. You're driving for Ferrari. And even Carlos said so himself. Even though he was having a fantastic time being part of McLaren's recovery, getting an opportunity to race in red for the Scuderia, that is something you don't ignore. That's what Ferrari can on. And the only time I can recall that Rubens showed any animosity about this arrangement was back in 2001 at the Austrian Grand Prix, where he had to let Michael pass for the championship. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about 2002. That happened. But it also happened the year before at the same circuit, and it all had something to do with him giving up the position on the final lap. And that time around, Rubens was very, very clear about what he thought, because on the race review video, Jean Tot is there trying to talk to Rubens, but Rubens just batting him off, saying, look, I don't want to know. But then he does change his tune. It's sort of along the lines of when you saw Benotto pointing his finger at Leclerc, giving him a talking to or trying to give him some sense of assurance. But then eventually Rubens comes back out and he says, look, I have a contract in which I have to obey orders. And that's the only time I've seen him get remotely angry. And that meant that the following year, when it happened again, you didn't hear Rubens really question it. And I think even Michael was sort of flabbergasted by it, and I think he thought it awkward. He probably would have remembered last year. That's why you saw him give the top step of the podium to Rubens, giving him the spiritual victory, and that's why Ferrari and he got a fine, because they broke F1's codes of conduct. And then maybe trying to make up for it in PR, or maybe give Rubens a hand, he decided to orchestrate a photo finish at the Indianapolis Grand Prix, which then ultimately gave Gave Barrichello the win. So I don't know whether it made amends or it was just a mistake, but either way, it happened. So I suppose that happened because the championship was already done and dusted after 11 races of 17. So, you know, couldn't hurt. Look, apologies for getting wrapped up in that for a moment, but it really does sum up what it takes to be a wingman at Ferrari, and that's in a way why Ferrari hired Carlos, to be the wingman for the new leader in Charles Leclerc, now he had proven himself against a four-time world champion who couldn't do the deed by getting the title for Ferrari, and now it was up to Charles to do it. And you might be thinking, what? That's absolutely absurd. Ferrari don't do team orders. Carlos and Charles, they get on absolutely fine. Ferrari says so. Them dubbing that pairing as C2. Now, whilst I find that quite clever, I also find it slightly cringeworthy. But hey, to each their own. But in a way, I feel like this is somewhat played up, this relationship. That sure, they probably do get on as friends, but they are really over-egging the pudding. And Ferrari are trying to emulate what McLaren did with Carl Lando relatively naturally. And don't get me wrong, I think they do get on with each other off the track, because many teammates do get on when they don't have to think about racing. But many times, when you get to the track, you want to beat your teammate. A switch inside of you tells you that you need to ultimately dominate against your teammate. But let's be clear here. Even though Ferrari are starting to get a pretty good handle when it comes to handling the new era of Formula One fan, as well as social media, and really trying to not make themselves look all hoity-toity and holier-than-thou, because they and Mercedes weren't around for the first season of Drive to Survive, and then they realised, ooh, 
it's quite popular. They decided to join in. They are just playing audiences to make everything look sweetness and light. That Ferrari, they changed, they modernized. That, oh, they're a lot more down to earth. That they are thinking about both drivers for the greater good of the team itself. And whilst that is partially true, the old culture of Ferrari is still there. Ferrari is a singular mass. And even though they are looking in the Concord Agreement to capping Ferrari's bonus and it's sort of going ahead, surprisingly, never saw that coming, that old culture of Ferrari is there to stay. It will never go away, no matter what they do to make themselves look good on social media. Remember, people use social media to show the best examples of themselves. That includes teams and companies. Charles is the leader and has been since effectively the end part of 2019. And Carlos was signed to help him out, especially in the first half of 2022, when it was looking likely that the Clegg could make a run for the title. Until one too many trip ups could tell that pursuit. Now, Charles doesn't get out of this unscathed, even though he is meant to be Ferrari's media darling. I'm actually starting to see more and more glimpses of what happened to Felipe Massa. When Felipe was given the opportunity to become the team leader, in the wake of Kimi Raikkonen basically just not giving a hoot as to what Ferrari thought of him, and wanting chalk ices and just having a good time before then going off to try NASCAR and rallying, Felipe got the opportunity to go for the title in 2008. 2009, he was the team leader, and then he had his horrific accident, which then sidelined him. So Fernando Alonso is brought in to then steady the ship. He becomes the brand new leader, and the four seasons that he and Felipe were together, he had to be the wingman. He had to be the person that would aid Fernando to either a chance for a world title or the constructors, neither of which occurred. And we did see Felipe kind of fall off. And I fear that might happen to Charles. Charles has been given his opportunity to lead the team. 2022 was a good opportunity. That didn't amount to anything. This year is his last chance to prove that he can be a team leader and a worthy adversary to Lewis Hamilton. And maybe try and be the team leader still, but if he can't do it, then that star power will be very, very tempting to give Lewis the preferential treatment, and then Charles will become the next Felipe. And... Yeah, I, I don't want that to happen. He's been given every opportunity possible. This is his biggest year yet, aside from 2022. He's been given a brand new race engineer, and so far the relationship seems quite good. It seems far less negative, more positive. It was very important to get rid of that race engineer because it did have a lot of negative connotations. There are lots of foul ups and mistakes associated with that pairing, so I think Ferrari and Fred needed to purge that to try and reset Charles's mind and give him the chance to try and build himself up before Lewis comes along so he can be the best example of that driver he can be. So far at Imola, he's done the business and therefore I think Carlos is going to be more and more marginalized. Ever since Hamilton was announced as their replacement for Carlos, the team has done its best to keep up appearances and keep their eyes on 2024. Especially if Ferrari and McLaren can rein in Max Verstappen and then capitalize on maybe Sergio Perez making more and more mistakes. I hope he doesn't, but Right now, Charles Leclerc has leapfrogged him, and Norris is right behind Checo. Signs could easily catch up too, and who knows what might happen with Piastri, so Checo needs to step up here, or else there could be a real major threat for Red Bull getting that team title again. Even McLaren's going to be looking at next year, and I really think that next year shows better opportunities to try and go for both titles. This year we might see some progress, and there might be a nice chance at the beginning of the season, but I think both teams have to be pragmatic that maybe Red Bull might have just enough in the tank to be able to step up above them, because this Imola upgrade that they did bring, even though it didn't work as intended, it was just about enough to keep them ahead, or at least Max in that car ahead. Ferrari will be increasingly thinking about next year especially, not really thinking about the needs of Carlos. They are going to be looking at what Charles Leclerc needs to be able to give him the best car that can run at his full potential. And then hopefully Lewis Hamilton will be able to slot into it quite nicely. What really summed things up for me was that whilst Leclerc was more supportive of the upgrade, saying that the team could be in contention and that the car's performance wasn't the limiting factor on the day, Sainz was less glowing and pointed out that things needed to be investigated before Monaco and that the media completely overhyped the upgrades that the team touted to all and sundry the week before. Carlos, I know you're a bit frustrated about losing to Piastri again, but I do feel like Ferrari knew what they were doing. If they wanted to keep these upgrades private, they would have told the Italian media to stay away from Fiorano. This is just yet another example of Carlos and Charles saying different things about the same product. That even though it didn't exactly blitz Red Bull, it certainly met expectations and brought them into the hunt. And things might be able to improve even more so in Monaco because they got another upgrade to try and consider. But Carlos is downplaying that as well. Whereas Charles thinks that they have what it takes to be able to give him a decent result. Even if he just gets a podium, that'll be his best result yet. He'll be just happy that Ferrari can give him the car that he can bring it home and not have a pit stop foul up. 
All of this negativity from Carlos is probably a major symptom of his current situation in him trying to stay at the top of the grid, Red Bull and Mercedes being his obvious targets. So while he's been trying to court them, sensing an opportunity about one of those drivers going, and of course Lewis going, and initially lots of people were thinking about that, but not so much anymore because, you know, Toto has some ideas. There's also the idea of Sauber and Audi, which has been long touted for science, but he's been really, really cold, aloof and distant about, almost snubbing. And then I saw that Audi and Sauber were being really, really public about courting Carlos Sainz, why he's the best ticket on the grid right now, what they could offer him, that they were really trying to, in a passive aggressive way, show that Come on, Carlos, sign the dotted line, please. And then the ante was well and truly up when the Swiss publication Blick published what Audi supposedly wanted to look for in terms of drivers if they couldn't get Carlos. Four drivers were on that list, in fact. Both Alpine drivers, so that's already going to cause fireworks at that team for this year, trying to see who's the best. And then there's the F2 champion of 2022 and the forever reserve driver Felipe Drogovic. And then there's, of course, Yuki Tsunoda. Yuki Tsunoda. Okay, cool. Nice. I'm glad that other teams outside of the Red Bull family are looking at him. He deserves it. I think Audi's sensing something, that science's situation is looking increasingly bleak. There are reports coming out of Sky Sports, I know, take it with a pinch of salt, that Mercedes are not looking to hire him. That the reason why that there might be a disconnect is to do with timescale. What Carlos wants right now is a situation and a deal that can be penned up within a matter of weeks, whereas Mercedes are reportedly looking to not really rush into things. They've got a timeline that is looking in the scale and span of months. They can look at other drivers. They can maybe get their reserve driver in, Mick Schumacher, maybe Kimi Antonelli, maybe they can bring Max Verstappen in if they can bring the money in. And of course, then there's Red Bull. There are reports coming out of Mexico, again, take it with a pinch of salt, that Red Bull are offering Checo a contract for one year, but then he wants two years, and maybe a one plus one deal could be arranged. So that means the short term future of Red Bull is really looking unlikely, unless Carlos pulls a Hail Mary and hopes that Max Verstappen is convinced to go to Mercedes if they can convince that their power unit is going to be the B's knees. And even though Perez has not really confirmed what's been said in terms of the media and specifics in terms of the length, he said that things are looking close and he's confident that things will be arranged, even though things haven't been signed yet. It's probably dawning on Carlos right now that things aren't looking all that great, because in the press conference before the Imola Grand Prix, he was saying that things were not progressing all that quickly. And no wonder, Red Bull and Mercedes are sort of losing the interest in you. That victory at the Australian Grand Prix, coming back from appendicitis, that's becoming a distant memory, and he's really not been able to capitalise on it ever since. The momentum of Ferrari, understandably, going toward Leclerc to prepare him for when his big star teammate comes in, and therefore Ferrari can fully transform themselves into the super team that we've not seen from them in the past couple of decades. Sure, Fernando being there was quite cool, but he was only one cog in the overall machine that wasn't quite all that pristine. Now, if they can sign Adrian Newey, that will be the last piece of the puzzle, and they will have a huge cast of superstars, including Rory Byrne from the old days as an advisor. It will be a really interesting team, and surely Ferrari will be able to give a challenge to Red Bull at that point, having so many big star names. But Carlos is not part of that cast. He was there to fill in the gap after Ferrari's worst season in nearly 40 years. Get them recovered, get them back on their feet, and sure enough, they have getting seconds and thirds for the last few years, second definitely likely, and maybe even a Constructors Championship to really get everybody hyped up for 2025, he's done his part as far as Ferrari concerned. Sure, he's been making things awkward along the way and not really subscribing to the idea of being the wingman, but the results are there, fair enough. Thank you very much, Carlos, but uh, yeah, can you just uh, go now, please? Because Lewis is getting antsy. Charles and Lewis have been spotted together so many times, and Lewis has been glowing and really talking about Ferrari and being excited. It's just, just stop. There's a season to go through, and it's just going to make Carlos feel even worse. And he really needs to just think about, look, I need somewhere to go. Sauber and Audi could be really good. They want you, Carlos. And as I've said, a team that really, really wants you can make all the difference. It's what got Piastri to McLaren and look how well he's doing. But realistically, it's up to Carlos what he chooses to do for the rest of this year. Does he decide to do what Sebastian Vettel did and just go out with good grace? Sure, he was hurt by the situation that happened without really much consultation on his part and probably via video call, but he then decides to not take it out on the team who gave him the opportunity, they worked together, and then they parted ways harmoniously, quietly, with good grace. 
Or does he keep doing what he's already been doing, stirring the pot sometimes when he senses an opportunity, trying to make himself look good for Red Bull and Mercedes, trying to encourage them to really consider him? Because I will say the staff and science lineup is pretty chaotic and I would love it, but it's really not looking likely anymore. There are just too many big star names or names that the team principals of certain teams are just completely enamoured over and Carlos is not really there for that time frame that they want. Because if he's not careful, he could easily have a year on the bench. Because if Carlos is not careful, Audi will lose patience, even though they've been so enamoured with him. They'll want to look for somebody to lock out their lineup alongside Nico Hülkenberg. Going back to that potential list of four drivers, Yuki Tsunoda, eh? I'm really quite impressed with that. But I'm also not surprised by that either, considering the season he's had so far. And that's partly the reason why in this video here, I think he's got a very good chance to stay in F1 for a good amount of time, certainly more than we expected.